if I want to be innovating, if I want to be growing, I want to ask myself new questions. If I ask new questions, then something new is going to come out of it. I've learned a lot along the way. Benvenuti a Ciao Bella. I'm your host, Erica Firpo. For the past 20 years, I've made my home in Rome, where I've worked as a journalist contributing to publications including Afar, Washington Post, Lonely Planet, and Travel and Leisure. I love sharing the stories of Italy's pioneering creators, and I'm bringing these stories directly to you on Ciao Bella. Every week, I'm joined by contemporary artists, heritage artisans, designers, culinary experts, innovative estites, and more. At the crossroads of evolution and tradition, the past and the future, they are working and creating to define and redefine 21st century Italy. Join me as we see Italy through their eyes. Lara Gilmore rocks. Hotelier, author, art collector, tastemaker, voracious brainiac, community leader, and dynamic duo with Massimo Bottura. Lara is unstoppable and one of my favorite guests on Ciao Bella. In previous episodes, Lara's joined me to talk about Casa Maria Luigia, her and Massimo's game-changing B&B in Modena, and Il Tortellante, the Modena-based tortellini lab and bottega for special needs young adults. Join me as I head back to Casa Maria Luigia to hear all about slow food, fast cars, Lara Massimo's newest book, which deep dives into CML culture. And we get a hint on the many, many more projects she is cooking up. So the book is called Slow Food, Fast Cars, which... Yes, stories and recipes from Casa Maluita. Which really speaks to this whole little microcosm of Modena. Yeah, and I think one of the first, you know, the first essay is... This is not Tuscany. (laughs) And there we go. (laughs) And there we go. This is Emilia Romagna and its beauty and its charms and, you know, the landscape is changing and, you know, we have to celebrate it. The farmhouses are crumbling. We just can't let it go. Can't abandon it and we have to love it. And the fact that we have this property here is kind of like, we want people to bore testimony to this moment in time and it's still standing and it's still working in the fields and you know the things are done in a certain way and I know all the farmers when I go on my run and you know their their tractors and I wave to them and how you know amazing is that came from New York and opened a restaurant and then ended up here in the middle of nowhere just trying to celebrate it's gonna be really humble reluctant kind of charming place that is so earnest and so much of the breaded basket of Italy, the most iconic ingredients, these beautiful products, and they're not even like, the one in Asia, where where do you find find a postcard? Like, they're not even like (laughs) boasting about it, or, you know what I mean? There's this very sort of like, get get on with it. I think they want to keep it to themselves. (laughs) (laughs) We're not supposed to talk about this. (laughs) But, uh, But it's really cool to be introducing people to that to this area, you know, and it's... I think you could do it. Some stories about... And you know what the problem is? I'm going to tell you this honestly. The first book, Never Just a Skinny Tiny Chef, so important, so conceptual, trying to get everything right. The stories, the mood. I had thought about it for so long, and then, like, you know, I worked on it for, like, almost two years, blah, blah, blah. Of course, there's things today do differently but I know it was like this tome and then Bread is Gold a light book but so important the stories and the message and you know fighting food waste and all these chefs coming in and they're kind of um, experimenting and putting themselves in this kind of challenge of cooking with you know the ingredients that were there a situation and in this book it's a hotel and it's nice yummy things to eat and it's kind of soft and fluffy and warm and fuzzy and I kind of the, the inner side of me is like it's not intense enough it's not like conceptual it's not like enough about you know what I mean but then I'm like you know what people come to a hotel they want to like have fun and they want to have yummy things and, and they want to see art and they want to be cozy and so I just told a lot of stories about how we put it together how we found the property, Um, not trying to be like a design book, but, you know, some funny art stories, and um, there's a little bit of humor in there, there's a little bit of, you know, stories about me, Massimo, and um, just how how we made it happen. So, 
That's what I, you know, I saw. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work or not. It is a cookbook. Tons of recipes, easy recipes. That is a beautiful. And then in the middle, there's this um, piece on Tula Dolce. So, a precursor to Gato Verde. Maybe Gato Verde will be more how it's on cookbook, but sort of where it came from and how it started and the ideas that make this place what it is. I think you do a great job. I think, and I, I feel like every time we come here, um, we find something new. We find, I mean, what, you know, whether it's the cherries, because if you come, you know, every, if you, uh, you know, if you come in September, there's some, aside from the parmigiano and the prosciutto and, and the balsamico that's always here, which is always amazing, yeah. and the brusco, but then we'll find something new every single time. Yeah, like, I was just in the orchard, it's like, I have all these apples, I have a tree full of apples. Are they the most delicious apples in the world? Well, I don't But this know. morning at but, breakfast, they were. Okay, good, 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 good. Oh, good, good, they good. were delicious. Okay, good, 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 good. Like, the I, baked ones in the, in yes, the wood burning Yes, I, okay. I love baked apples. Okay. And I said to Doris, I said, this is the best baked apple I've ever had. Oh, yay. Because it, it wasn't, like, it, it hit all the right notes. It oh. had a little sweet, the cinnamon. I mean, it was just baked perfection. That was like... When I, whenever I, if I, if I do, if I go out for breakfast in Rome, I always, I'm like, is that chai qualcosa con mela? I always ask for something with apple. And so when I had that, I was like, oh, it made me feel so at home. <laughs> and I don't know if you noticed, but we have like more and more vegetables and fruit and trying Thanks. to keep that going. And just, you know, that idea that breakfast is like, it's such an important meal and you know, let's just, I don't know. I do sports just get that breakfast here. I really do. Can I tell you that I was, I was saying this to Darius this morning. I think that when I, the first time I had breakfast here, which I think was four years ago, um, it actually really changed my mind about how I eat breakfast. Because, like I said, I'm a sweet tooth. You came in 2.20. Wasn't that the first time you guys was came? Was it 2.20? Was it just yes. after the pandemic? That Is that, yeah, it was 2.20. It was like just, June yeah. for your birthday. Yeah, it was just after the and pandemic. And I remember because we went out, we went downtown Modena, yeah. and you were like, oh my God, it's so lively here compared yeah. to Rome. It's like people are on the street. Yeah, because and everybody was out outside. And yeah. Everyone was socializing. And it was hot. It was great. And then I had breakfast. And... And I and I said to, I said to Darius this morning I said I think it really changed how I think about like it in a in a really good way how I think about my breakfast and what I want to eat and mm -hmm. the the things I want to you know it, as you know I mean maybe not eating maybe the cotechino every single day isn't the best idea <laughs> which you know I, I I dedicated a podcast post to that cotechino and last night by the way I was like oh no I have another cotechino the one with the isn't with, that amazing I love that cotechino it's addictive it's addictive with the, the sour oh, flavor of the sangue di drago the I plum know. sauce it was like I was like I was like Darius I have another podcast I have to do on <laughs> cotechino more cotechino uh, it's and, he, and it's so so funny because this morning he looks at me and he's like you're and I was like I'm having I'll take your cotechino too <laughs> Uh, but I do have to say, it really, I started really thinking a different way about about how I'm eating breakfast, <laughs> and and it and it definitely it like kind of it's transformed my, my my breakfast mentality. Oh, good, 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 good. It was time that Italy got like a breakfast, you know, shuffling. Like, oh, it definitely. Differently. Like, okay, yes, we have our brioches and everything. How good they, as however good they can be. There's so many other amazing flavors that. Why well, say wait for lunch? You know, let's start now. <laughs> you know what I was thinking when I was I was walking over to Gatsby last night. I was thinking to myself how every single time that I come to visit you, there's always something new. You're on to the next night, and it's really fascinating for me because you know I was kind of less less and I couldn't sleep, and so I just like started doing what I do best, which is make notes <laughs> and. I made, I started making this list and I was like, okay, restaurateur, marketing genius, book author, mm -hmm. hospitality. I mean, it, and it was like social work. I mean, it was like going on and on and, and, you know, so, you know, no, don't, then, uh, don't make that list. It, well, it's a lot. Yeah, exactly. Excuse me. <laughs> it's a long list and then a lot of different projects and then like, like the over, and then we add that overlap running a business and then traveling so much and but it does not fail that every time I come here I find something new I find a new project last night we took a walk around and we were like wait a minute yeah there's we a whole back out area yeah, we and opened it up I'm building a, like a little change in that area back there and then this is the house that's the next project yeah that's going to be in October but um you're going to start in October or it's going to be open by October no we start working on it and it'll be done it'll be by November, November. <laughs> no, I can't. Hopefully June. 
Um, but, you know, already breakfast can be a little bit different. Not what we serve, but how we serve it. So I'm going to move it over to this, this house here. So um, you'll go out of the courtyard. There'll be an opening in the hedge. And then right with opening the hedges, I don't know if you saw it, but I should take you over. We have a sculpture of Pinocchio. So breakfast is <laughs> go through the door and then at Pinocchio, go left. Okay, go so right. You know what I mean? So last night when we were leaving the restaurant, when we were leaving Gato Verde, which I kind of like, I, I, I don't want to call it a restaurant as much as it's to me like an experience. Um, mm -hmm. um, and we were leaving and it's 11.30 at night and it's dark and there's like a little bit of fog coming in and I looked to my left and I saw a giant Pinocchio and I don't know if you remember this, when Charlie was younger and he was like, and I told him the only thing I'm afraid of in life mm -hmm. and he teased me so much, it's Pinocchio! Ah! So I saw this monster Pinocchio and I was like, I'm sorry, I have to go. <laughs> and he's like, no, don't you want to see the sculpture? I'm like, I can't, not at night. I was like, that's a one thing. I won't sleep. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it in the daytime. So I, I will I was there, right? Yeah, 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 well, okay, fine. Um, so the idea of, like, this Pinocchio playfulness. Um, Who's I'm going like, to copy the American Academy. Have you seen American Academy in Rome where they do their dining? There's that bay hedged in kind of space, and it has a big door. Yeah. I'm going to make one of those doors so that I keep the hedge here, dividing the properties, but there's just this door that's open. And you basically get in front of the courtyard where there's the Baba by Kia, and then you're just going to go enter that way. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to go out on the pavement anymore where the cars are. Once you're in the property, you can just kind of wind around. You Which, know what I mean? By the way, it's not bad walking over there because all of a sudden you, like, you get the vineyard, you see the vendemia. <laughs> it smells really good. Um, today we're not doing the vendemia because it's going to rain, but they started vendemiare. I'm getting all of our like, can I chefs in the kitchen and. I saw on your Instagram that you said at uh, Aceto di Balsamico. Mm -hmm. um, are you also making wine as well? No, just at this Aceto. It's for the Mosto Cotto. Okay, and you have 1,300 barrels. Is that? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Is, mm -hmm. is that is that gonna, is that completely separate from Villa? Was it Villa Manadori? Mm -hmm. So Villa Manadori, we started making basically when we opened up Austria Francescana. And we've always made it in, um, you know, um, more of like a production warehouse, not meant to be. We didn't have a villa, uh, an apartment. Um, we didn't have a place that was one of those historical places to make it. And um, now we're bringing everything together and seeing how to bring the production of Villa Manadori here because there isn't that much space because there were already these 1,400 barrels of extra old balsamic vinegar, like the extra old ones. But the Manadori is a blend. It's a blend of extra old and younger vinegar. And so you have this product that's really great to use every day, marinating, salads, you know. Mm -hmm. As much as I love extra old balsamic vinegar, it's not something I want to use every single day. And it's not great for cooking. I know it's so... Uh, it is really good on that the temperature. Yeah, it's great on the frittata. <laughs> I mean, it's great to drizzle on things. So, yeah, you know, I totally um, understand. so we might eventually move Villa Manador here. There are a lot of logistics that are involved in that because the bottling and the shipping is a whole different quantity okay. compared to the balsamic vinegar. We bottle, we have a bottling machine. We take care of all everything on property. So a big part of the work that we did when we bought the property last um end of June, July, not only like doing a facelift, painting it green and, you know, putting better lighting in where you go up and visit the barrels, but the bottling area was needed like major investment. Um, also where we keep the Mosto Cotto, we now have refrigerated three different oh. cylinders because you get the grapes, you press them. And you want to keep them at temperature until you're able to boil them. But there's so much, there's, the vineyard is, is large. So, you know, it's like a holding tank because otherwise it starts to 
change and ferment from the minute that you press it mm -hmm. if you don't put it under temperature it like starts to make this transformation so anyway we invest in that and the bottling and then we got all that space of Gato Verde because we cleaned out the old barn and you know it's just filled with junk and we're like okay let's activate the space here and give this wonderful brunch feeling mood that we love ha try to translate it into a restaurant and you know we just opened so we're, it's going to take a while to figure out the outdoor deck there you know originally it was supposed to be covered and then I was like I don't know if I want to cover it maybe I'll put some umbrellas up but I don't know if I want a big heavy well, I, I love you, the open sky last night I was looking at all the constellations I mean it was it was like it was like a show it was just it was quiet also because you know there's it's there's no sound. There's no sound here. You can see all the stars. I mean, it was that was the show for me right there. It's very dark, I know. Massimo keeps saying, you need more light, you need more lights. I'm like, I don't know. It's not good for the bugs. It's not good for the insects, the pollinators. It's polluting. I'm like, well, I like to keep the lights really low. Yeah, you get a little bit lost. I'm making no, some signs. But it's kind of like, when you get in the countryside to do that, Yeah. You know? Um. So I'm glad you liked it. Did you have the pasta arsa? That the pasta that was like almost a pre-dessert. It's the, Is it, yes, the grain, the, yeah, that we, sort we, of we, ancient we, grain. We they were lentic, yeah, they said they're not lentikia, and it had like three levels underneath mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and it was kind of you know it was funny because it's sweet and savory yeah. and. And I've never, I've never ever used the, this terminology for food, but the transition from that and then to that like granita. Okay, I was, love the granita. It was like, it was amazing because the, the pasta archa, archa, is that what it's called? Arsa. Arsa. I think it's a Sardinian, it's kind of like, it's not a grain like bulgur. It actually is a pasta that's made. That's what they But it's doing. made with this particular kind of um, multi-cereal grain. So it's got this very intense, old, ancient grain feeling to it. It and was flavor. It was. It it's was intense. It was really delicious, and the flavor combination was like unexpected, but at the same time, it's so comforting. Okay. It was such a good segue into them. We get to see what she's thinking. Exactly. How they're like imagining it, and there are people who love the dessert and people who don't love the dessert. It's not an easy dessert. The pink, the gray, oh, the, 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 the rose, moon. Yeah, moon. it's the, the gray moon. Wait, the pink it? moon, but yeah. then it's gray, and then it's like the caviar and the raspberry, and that was so it's, surprising. It's complicated. It's really complicated. So for me, even segueing with the, the pasta arsa, like I, when I think of anything, I, I, I my sweet but tastes right, right, right. But I, I, I really liked. I really like the, the, the rosette. I don't know, it's not a rosette, it's called... But it was like a rose, yeah, I don't it's, remember what it's called. It's, exactly. like, it's like moon rose, I think, because mm -hmm. we were talking about rose, pink, pink, dra yeah, pink, pink moon, moon yeah. yeah. Drake, and then it changed, and... Um, and uh, by the way, the, the thing, as you know... Isn't it beautiful, so the kitchen, to see them uh, there? The kitchen, yeah. It's like, you have that whole like walk-in kitchen, it's amazing. I mean, it's like it's like a... It looks like um, a tableau a tableau vivant, you know, like yeah. like a painting, but when they reenact paintings. I love it because it's sort of old-fashioned looking with the fire behind it. When you look at like old, you know, pictures of people with their, you know, cooking out of the embers and things like that. But then it's so contemporary. We want to promote young talent and give them room and give them space and give them a voice and a flavor. And every single chef is different. You know, the Cavallino and there's. Virginia and Ricardo, they both have become like co-chefs. We decided that sous chef and chef, it was better to make them both the head chefs, girl and boy. Huh. Kind of the way, uh, I don't know, Gucciester is sort of working that way too, even though it's not official. But in Cavallino, we, we made this decision because Virginia is so much better at personal handling of the team working with them, much more communicative, and Ricardo is old school chef. You need that too, but together, great combination. They work really well. But um, I do think it's, I, well, actually I think that was the other thing, like I, as I said, it's like a tableau vivant, but it's also amazing because, especially with these new, like the show, um, The Bear, I don't know if you got to see right. that. Beautiful, like, like 
harmonized, really balanced group of people working together. It's fascinating to see how they work in a kitchen and the timing that, and the intensity. I'm given like a first, not a front row into how they work together. It was really, really nice to see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we have to think also about. I think the world has changed. We have to make spaces. So if you go back in that kitchen. Every, we tried to make every single part of the kitchen a beautiful space. Now, if you go back in the kitchen, like I went back in the kitchen of the um, Langham Hotel, and Michelle Rue is the chef there, it's just an ugly kitchen. It's just like an ugly hotel kitchen. There's so many ugly back of house, greasy. Jessica tells me about when she travels around the world and goes and they do events and they're in these like, really ugly kitchens. And I think, you know what? You're working. Those are the hours you have a person like working for you. How can they make beautiful food if they're not in a space that feels clean and beautiful? And you know what I mean? Yes, they have to be functional kitchens. I'm not putting wallpaper on the walls, but like make them spaces that are inspiring. Make people feel like, oh, I'm at, I work in a place that, you know, feels really, really good. I think that's been... It's a new thing, but I think it's really that, important. I think you guys have been really great at making that, that idea of community and making your team feel really good. I think you guys have been very pioneering with that. Um, it's so important. It's so important. It's not just, you know, because you have to keep people on your staff. You know what I mean? Now people are like, oh, well, you can't treat the barista like shit um, anymore. You know, oh, you're lucky to have a job. You have to kind of... I'm like, but we never treated people like shit. Like, well, why should anybody be treated like shit? Like, it doesn't matter what you're cleaning rooms, you're, you know, helping with the gardening, your young chef coming into the kitchen. Why should anyone be treated like shit? Nobody. Nobody should. And, and I think that also, I think that is that translates here as like as the guest. Like, you're creating a really lovely space for the people that you work with that then spreads out to the guests that are here. I overheard someone say, oh, goodbye, we'll see you next year. Oh, looking forward to seeing you again. Like everybody, you know, has probably the same feeling that I have, which is like, I'm coming home, oh, you know? I and I think that. that's, and I think that's also what you do with your kitchens. Also open them up so that you can kind of see behind the I scenes. Love it. I love it. And the new space for the kitchen, I'm gonna move over there, the breakfast kitchen, is going to be a little bit less dining room and more living room Ooh. with tables at breakfast, but also, you know, you want to sit at a lounge sofa and have your breakfast there so that the rooms are also used not just for breakfast. And with this idea that you can kind of look into the kitchen and see the chefs like, you know, preparing the breakfast and what they're doing. So I don't know if this is going to pass with the team because I have this imagination of it and maybe they're like, Laura. It's not realistic, it's not gonna happen. But that house is designed in a way that has some back spaces that we can, you know, have our big walk-in refrigerators and all that kind of stuff and pantry that maybe, you know, you don't necessarily want the guests to be there and see. But then these other spaces that I want it to feel like just this big cozy house, the fireplace, and you know, the breakfast is there, and it's literally the we're the we're burning up and it's here, I'm gonna make another passageway because the breakfast is like right there. So that there's this sense of guests walking that way, our team can, can do everything connected here, and just make it more, even more of um, like a living, breathing experience, you know? So, we'll see. I don't we'll think, does anybody ever say, Lara, these ideas aren't gonna fly? They never say that to you, your ideas are great. Well, sometimes it's like I, I imagine things and then they're not realistic, so I'm starting to have like a once a week meeting with the breakfast team, F and B team, Jessica will be in there. My son, my buddy, my son, my son, my will say no, but <laughs> still be like the last. He's like the last at the beach I have to arrive at. Um, I don't know, I just want to have fun and imagine, like, it's not fun for me to do the same thing that I did a year ago. And I also feel like <laughs> if I want to be innovating, if I want to be growing, I want to put my, I want to ask myself new questions. I ask new questions, then something new is going to come out of it. I've learned a lot along the way, so maybe every room won't be a different color, but maybe they will. You know what I mean? In one hand, I'm like, well, that's it's time consuming, and then you know the painters always are coming in and fixing like, what color is room four? What color is this? It's stressful. 
And, you know, maybe it's better that way because it keeps it so lively and unexpected. And every time you come, there's like a different, I don't know what room you guys are in. I didn't ask. We're in the top. <gasps> yeah. Fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. We love it. And it's, you know, you're right. Every, every time you come, if you stay in a different room, which I like to do, <laughs> it's a totally different personality. And it's like, and you, I feel like kind of like I get a different personality too, okay. which is, you know, like, I don't know, like it could be like, I could be like, like maybe, cause also it's this, this is the beginning of fall. It's the first day, yeah, kind you of know, changing. I'm kind of trying I'm, I'm, I'm always changing. Like I come back from my vacation at the end of the summer. I take those last two weeks, usually in August and go to Colorado, see my mom, do some uh, and, and before I leave, I have this moment of nostalgia, like my last swim in the pool. Even though I'll probably go swim, I you know, I will, but it's not the same. Like your swim in August is not the same when you come back in September. It's just summer is over and you move into like a whole other phase. I move into like a whole other me. I know, do too. Functional, what am I doing? Where am I going? What's happening? How am I going to pull this together? You know, like the rush until Christmas, you know, I have like from now to December. Oh my 24. God, I don't, I don't even want to. And it's like, you know what I mean? So like get, to get so much done. We'll see what happens next time I come back because yeah. we'll, be, we'll be on the next iteration. Yeah. I, I, have, I have a question uh, about Gato Verde. I was reading somewhere, they described Gato Verde as sustainable, ethically and aesthetically. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because I know that, that's yeah. a big word, but I do know that you guys have a lot of different initiatives. Like I know you know when I saw the kitchen, just the fact that Jess, when she when she showed me the um, the capa, the, the, the stove, I guess, and she was like, yeah. she's like, we got this in Florence. It's like a hundred year old company. It's one of the best company, yeah, you know. Universo. So which we decided not to go with like the Jasper or some, you know, made in Norway kind of grill where like, Let's see what we can get in Italy. And the, the Forno is made in Modena. The, mama the mom, I saw that. It's made in Modena. And then, you know, I think what we did this time is we thought about, like, how even the outdoor decking, there's this special grout that um, the, between the, the stones that drains, and then underneath, it's not cement. It's all layers of gravel. Oh. So with this kind of compact gravel cushion, I don't know what it's called. So instead of putting cement, we did gravel, then this cushion, and then we did the tiles on top of that with mm. this draining. So the, um, the um, I don't, what is it called? The grout, yeah. The grout that's indoors is different than the grout outdoors. So that it can literally go through, and we put cisterne underwater to collect water, and that water is used for irrigating that part of the property. So we're not going to well water, we're not like doing that. Wow. Um, solar panels on the roof. Uh, we had never done that. Like, I would just, I don't know, with this house, I felt a little anxious about adding too many new things, mm -hmm. like new technologies, because it was an old house. But that was just like an empty, you know, Wow. 1960s barn or 1930s, I don't even know when it's from, cement, you know, it, had, it was just like a shell. So at that point, we had to add everything. So why don't we try to do something innovative that we had never done before? We even have this machine that takes the smoke from the wood-burning oven and the Universo, and it, like, cleans it out so that we're not pushing into the sky, you know, directly the, um, the, 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 the smoke from burning wood, which... You know, it's lovely and it smells good and everything, but it's not so great for the atmosphere. Right. I think Jess mentioned, she was saying, we're lucky because creating that, you guys had the choice from the beginning to say, how can we do this better? It's like you're saying, always asking yourself that question. Yeah, and how to do things a little bit differently. Of course, we have refrigerators, we have air conditioning, we have heating. Um, it's not as if like we did a build up from the ground up where we could say like, okay, thermal, dynamic, what, it's the best we could do. We tried to do the best we could do and then we'll see where it goes. I mean, restaurants, I think that they it's are, impossible. they have the huge carbon footprint, you know, it's impossible. And we really try to be very good about not wasting, especially food, water, all those well, that gravel elements, thing is, is that is super clever. It's I, super cool. Yeah, I think I would I, I would love to see what um, what the design look like. I would like to you know like um what the layers look yeah, like. Yeah, I have some pictures maybe of that's, how we did that's it really as, cool. as we went. Um, 
Yeah, because there's like a big issue about rainwater. So the driveway was already asphalted. It would already have asphalt mm-hmm. on it. Um, because I thought about like, okay, we get rid of all the asphalt, and I'm just gonna do this like dry earth kind of come back to think you go to the parks in Paris, right? You know? That becomes mud, right? It's going to be like puddle, mud, yeah. clay. You know, it's hard because you don't want to like have cement and asphalt everywhere. And this is great, the Porfido, but like very hard to maintain for big, big surfaces. Right. So they're always like coming up because that drains really well. The, this is called Porfido? Yeah, it's oh. the Porfido, those little ones. Like I would call them San like, Pietrini. <laughs> yeah, it's a, San Pietrini, and they, you know, there's like a tiny bit of cement mixed with the, right. with the sand just to keep the sand stable. Right. But it just rains and goes right and down. down. Right down, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but you don't want to eat on that really because it's like. It's a little unbalanced, I guess. It's unbalanced, mm-hmm. and it's. Like, this was our first attempt, you know? And then I think, you know, it's hard. I look at Francesca and I think, how am I going to be able to transfer all these things that I'm learning and growing and doing here and bring them back to Francescana when it's such an old building, we're kind of crunched in there, you know what I mean? It's like we don't have much room, we don't, you know, how to add special machines and things like that. Like we're already trying to figure out how we can change or make that better or more, you know, consume less. And, and it's just, it's hard when it's in an old building like that, so... Same. I wanted to ask you, I mean, I saw you working out this morning. You just move around a lot. You, and I mean, even <laughs> conceptually. And I want to ask you how you do that. Because I, I, I get exhausted <laughs> just thinking about it. I'm like, because you, you're changing mindsets too, you know, because you're thinking Gato Verde. Yeah. Then you're thinking hospitality for a cosmetic leaf. So it's like one step at a time. You know what? I used to stress and want everything perfect all the time, like perfectly done. Now I'm in a phase where I'm like, oh, let me just start. Let's just start. And then we'll figure it out as we go along. And, you know, we'll fix the courtyard. And You know what I mean? And it's okay not to have it, you know. I feel like embarrassed that that house is that color. I would have painted it immediately. I don't like that yellow. On the other side, I painted the shutters, but I didn't get time to paint the shutters here. But I'm like, well, you know, we're a little bit imperfect right now. And the people see that we're a work in progress and that things are growing and changing and moving. and. I think it's important. I think it's important too. I like that. Perfection is so overrated. It's just too much of a stress. It's not, it's, you don't need it. Yeah, and for what? Like, nothing's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Also, I, a great, I always say a great mistake is a great opportunity, you know? And so, or, you know, it's just, if I, I don't know, it's not even a mistake. I mean, just, I, I can't, I don't like perfection because I could never achieve it. Yeah, I'm not, maybe that's, I don't have, that's, maybe that's it. Well, no, it's, it's just, I don't have that patience. I, I just want to have fun. I want to, I want to try to do a great job, you know? And try new things. Like I keep saying, try new things, try new things, try new things, you know? Keep cool. playing, keep playing. That goes back to what I said every single time I come here. It's something new. And it's so much fun talking to you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Lara, and everyone at Casa Maria Luigia and the Francescana family for making this episode happen. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ciao Bella. The editor of Ciao Bella is Mastro. Production manager is Jenna Spray. If you're new to Ciao Bella, take a peek at ciaobella.co, our all-encompassing Italy-focused website, where you'll find insider insight on contemporary Italy. And sign up for our newsletter for new episodes and articles. Follow me on Instagram at Erica Firpo, and follow Ciao Bella on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Leave us a rating or comment. Ciao, ciao.